Hello, I'm Keith Kendrick. I'm editor of BBC Good Food magazine, and I'm joined today by Sabrina Gayor, the renowned British-Iranian chef and author, whose latest cookbook is simply called Simply. She's also a guest on the new Good Food Rookie Chef podcast, discussing the cooking of her heritage and giving a masterclass in how to cook the famous Persian rice dish, Tardig. Is that right, Sabrina? Tardig. Tardig. I don't want to correct Nadia. <laughs> <You've got me. laughs> Tardig. Tardig. Yeah, yeah. Tardig. Today, I've asked her to share with us three essential things we all need to know about Persian cooking. We've got a lot of time in the kitchen at the moment, so let's get adventurous. So what can you share, Sabrina? Thanks for coming on board. Thank you. So um, I think the first things first, having grown up in England, I you know, have spent most of my life here. I've shopped in the same supermarkets. I've watched the same food telly. And I know I'm, I kind of feel more British, really, but I do understand people's phobias and what they're scared of and obviously if we're leading with rice as one of the dishes that we've put out that would probably be top of uh, Britain's list of things they're scared of making um the one thing I wanted to say is Persian food is not complicated it really isn't you don't need a thermometer you don't need to cook things in seven ways and make 50 pots of food it's not like that at all so if I could if I was telling somebody who's completely alien to this cuisine and just wants a little bit of reassurance, I would say, actually, it's probably one of the more simple, um, less uh, complex uh, places to start, not just from the perspective because um, it's quite humble, but also there's just not that much involved. It's quite a simple cuisine, but it is, its simplicity is almost interpreted as elegance um, by many other cultures. So um, don't be afraid. It's really, really easy and it's a lot more familiar than you think. That would be my first thing to explain to people. Okay. Uh, my second thing, which is, I always think this is the one that's the shocker, um, is if I asked a room full of a thousand people, what's your, wh what word would you use to describe Middle Eastern food? What, what word comes to mind apart from like yummy or things like that were descriptive? Most of those people would go spice. Mm. Yeah. I think I was um, going to go with aromatic, but you know. Same sort of, I mean, aromatic is actually a really good way of describing Persian food, but spice actually isn't terribly on the money. Um, Persians really don't like spice, don't use it. Uh, the only spice that we do use, uh, purely because we cultivate it, uh, is saffron. And we use that absolutely right in an aromatic capacity. Uh, it's used to perfume meats and add aroma to dishes, probably from the, the times pre-refrigeration where especially meat would have been hung for a while and wouldn't have a particularly pleasant smell because there was no refrigeration. I think that's where the tradition of sort of packing in the saffron came because it really, it is very heady and aromatic. Um, is it enormously expensive as well? Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. We cultivate over 92% of the world's saffron and it really is... Um, incredibly special and it's been proven that the saffron from Iran is of the highest quality purely because it just gives you the highest release uh, of potency that you need so there are many pretenders and unfortunately um, I, I, you'd be surprised at how many one and two Michelin star chefs really don't know how to use saffron I've had quite shocking conversations with them and just in a helpful capacity sort of said look you, you really need to understand saffron is like a tea and you need to brew it, grind it down and brew it in hot water to really release it. Otherwise, it's just like throwing, you know, paper money into a pot and down the drain, essentially. Mm -hmm. So and, and too much is also um, a hallucinogenic. So <laughs> it, too much will be a party you don't want to be uh, a guest at. Um, so, yes, that, that spice is really important to us. And the other spice we used to cultivate a lot of, but not so much anymore, is cumin. But we only really use it in one traditional dish, which is a very simple cumin rice. Um, and that uh, that's kind of a strange thing for a lot of people, especially 
people that might know Persian food by way of any of my writings because I love Harissa, which is North African. I love Pul Bebe, which is Turkish. You know, I have sort of mixed in preserved lemons and all these things. And, you know, the truth is they're just not Persian. Persian cuisine is best described as aromatic, but incredibly simple. Um, and it's herbs, it's uh, citrus, tomato, and really sour we love sour and we love grilled meats it Cabot, sounds the word yeah, it's wonderful I, I, and i'm sure a lot of the recipes are in your your cookbook simply presumably lots of simple recipes uh, interestingly enough simply isn't actually my easy book because i've always felt that how do you simplify simplicity itself? All of my recipes are pretty much, uh, you know, fairly simple, yeah. fairly easy, only because I'm a lazy cook and I want the fastest route to everything. And I realize that's a human condition. So, um, but simply is, um, it's a better way of explaining what kind of food is in the book because it's neither Eastern nor Western. And yet it is Eastern and Western. And if you're trying to describe what kind of food I make it's kind of impossible because I use harissa fish sauce dried limes you know butternut squash which is very western for us um so it's just simply Sabrina food which is why that got that yes. label um, so what's the third thing about Persian cooking that uh, that we all need to know about because uh, you know saffron cumin that's really really interesting and uh I've got some saffron actually I imagine that it degrades quite quickly so I may need to get something fresher I don't know you would be surprised. Good saffron can have a two or three year shelf life, but the most important elements for saffron is the quality you purchase. And even though Persian saffron is expensive, it's actually cheaper than the not great stuff that you might find in certain shops and supermarkets. So it's it's an odd one, but you just have to know where to look to find it. Um, and it's the storage, the how you store it. It doesn't like sunlight. It doesn't like extreme heat. It likes to be stored in a dry, cool, dark kind of um, uh, environment, really. And that will just mean that you'll, you'll, you'll be able to use it for quite some time. And Persians freeze it. Yeah, so lots so of ways is, to keep it. Is there a third thing that we need to know about Persian food? Oh, definitely. There is a third thing. Um, so Persian food is essentially um, quite easy on the pocket. And I think now more than ever, it's quite important because I've never been the kind of girl to write recipes to send you out to get 5,000 ingredients that you don't have, don't know what they are and will never use again. I think for me as an author, but more as a reader, that has always been my frustration looking at recipes and thinking, how the hell am I ever going to use extract of back swings ever again in a recipe? You know what? You know, we've all done it. Open the cupboard and go... Yeah, 1996 why that? <laughs> I think that was and like oh, yeah. I spent tenor on it and so what I love about Persian cuisine it's really really simple it's incredibly ex accessible but also it's a bit of a contrast a bit of a strange dichotomy because our culture is embedded in the the finery and luxury of the Persian empire which mm. was the largest landmass spanning empire and you know very very famous for being you know they really loved their luxury they had an inordinate wealth um and they did trade with all countries all over the world um trading things like saffron pistachios and um i was going to say asparagus but not asparagus pomegranates and and whatnot it was particularly um, very food oriented a lot of their trays so all the traditions that exist in classic Persian homes a lot of them do still derive from the Persian empire banqueting and feasting just the way we serve rice we always serve it in a mountain mm -hmm. you know it's never flat we never serve food in bowls where you can't see it it's always on a flat plate even if it's a small portion because it's about the uh, abundance the, the yeah, visual exactly. appeal of entertaining so it's strange because then you've got that kind of like upper end of luxury but then essentially it's home cooking it's uh, a lot of the times it's not peasant food but it is really home cooking and the same food that they would maybe eat in a palace you would also eat in home there's no sort of just distinguishing between the two we don't whip out beef you know fillet of beef or something for a special occasion it's just 
for royal occasions back in you know pre-revolution and, and and entertaining and weddings it would just be all the same food but just like 10,000 times yeah. the quantity <laughs> because we're feeders that's the other thing you need to know nobody's gonna feed you ain't no party like a persian party um so if you know anyone in fact anyone middle eastern you know and they invite you over for dinner like go because you'll never eat as well well uh, all our homes are palaces at the moment aren't we so we need to make yeah. the most of them. we need to cook great things we need to get great ingredients and we need to uh, you know to follow your fantastic advice so uh Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks for coming on board. Uh, you've, you've done a much longer chat with, uh, with Nadia, our rookie chef. And I listened to that the other day. It was half an hour of just, it was so entertaining. It was so useful. It was so interesting. And I just thought, this is great. So I look forward to this chat that we've just had. And, uh, and thank you very much for coming along. Oh, thank you so much for having me.